So this week's lesson is on AC power generation. I am going to take the conversation a little bit farther than that though. The AC generator, the DC generator, even the AC motor and the DC motor, they all have similar construction. Of course, there are, there are tons of variations in terms of how they exactly function, but in terms of the general conversation, this lesson that we're going to have today really applies to all of them. It's kind of the starting point from where they all build. Okay, But before we get into the actual uh, construction and, and functioning of the machine itself, I want to back up a step and just put some perspective on this. Okay, So let's talk about AC power generation. So let's talk about all of those power plants that exist out there that provide us with our power. And, and, and what kind of power plants are we talking about? So if we go back historically, maybe the conversation starts with coal power plants, okay? And then um, those coal power plants have probably been retrofitted now so that they operate using natural gas. Um, move forward a little bit and there's lots of nuclear power plants. Whoops, nuclear power plants. Um, and then we've got hydroelectric dams. Okay. Um, and next, let's talk about wind turbines. Wind turbines. And the one that's different, I'll mention it here, uh, solar. It's the one that doesn't follow the rule for us. Okay. Now, Let's talk about what these have in common. Okay, so the first three, coal, natural gas, and nuclear, they all work to generate heat. Okay, so let's back up a step and talk about what's happening here. So one of the laws of nature says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, just changed. So if we want to create electrical energy, we have to, to get it from somewhere. Okay, so in these first three cases, we are using some form of, of energy to create heat. Hydroelectric is just water, okay, but, uh, and of course wind turbines, just the wind, but these can all be grouped together right here. Um, and the key word, it's only appearing here once, but there it is. These are all about turbines, okay? So up here where we're creating heat, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to use that heat to create steam, and the steam is going to power the turbine. It's going to turn the turbine. Okay, hydroelectric, we use water, usually falling water, to turn the turbine. And wind turbines, of course, we use the wind. But in all cases, it's about turning a turbine. Okay, so how does this all tie into what we've been learning so far this term? Okay, all of these, with the exception of solar, all of these AC power generating stations use magnetism magnetism and more specifically induction okay we use the turbine to rotate and to give us our cutting action that's what causes that's what gives us that relative motion the cutting action between the lines of flux and the conductor so we need those lines of flux we get some cutting action so the conductor cuts through those lines of flux and induction is ultimately what produces the energy. Okay, so, so that kind of brings us up to why this is the next logical conversation for us. We've talked about magnetism and induction. Now we're going to apply it. We're going to learn about what we call rotating machines, okay, which are both AC and DC generators and motors. They're all rotating machines and they all apply this conversation about induction, okay, in order to do whatever it is they do. So let's begin. Okay, lesson four, AC power generation is what it's called, but we are going to look at the DC power generation as well. In fact, that's probably where we'll spend a lot of our time looking at uh, what's happening. And uh, we'll also pepper that with a little bit about motors as well, just to kind of look at the, the general construction of all of them, how they compare. So DC, gener DC generators and AC alternators. Okay, let's look at, first of all, their construction, and then we'll 
look at the operation. So beginning at the beginning, the construction. So a, G, a generator and a motor, either DC or AC, have the same basic construction. So this is what I said already is, is there's so many different variations once you get into the specifics, but in terms of the basic construction, they all have these same things in place. Then I want to talk about these next two bullets. So we've got the generator and the motor, and all they do is convert energy. Okay, that's really what they're doing. So a generator is taking mechanical energy, okay, or heat energy or something that gets that mechanical energy started, which we call the prime mover. Okay, there's that term right there. The prime mover uh, is that mechanical energy within the generator, and we convert that into electrical energy through induction. <clears throat> a motor, instead of outputting the electrical energy, that is the input into the motor, and the result is an output of mechanical energy, uh, which is rotation. And we accomplish that through the interaction of two magnetic fields. So we create two magnetic fields that push and pull against each other around a central point of rotation, which is the shaft of the motor, uh, and we get rotation. So we're going to look at four different parts. We're going to look at the frame. We're going to look at the armature or the rotor. Those are two different construction designs of that part of the rotor, sorry, that the motor or generator that rotates. Um, we're going to look at the stator, the poles and the windings. And the fourth item there, you see these things called commutators and slip rings and brushes. OK, so those are just that's just a list of the things we're going to look at. So let's start with the frame. So the frame is exactly what you would expect it to be. Um, it's got other names. It's sometimes called the chassis or the yoke. Uh, whether we're talking about a motor or a generator doesn't matter. This is the physical construction of the motor. It includes things like, like its dimensions. So we could be talking about a motor or a generator, which is extremely tiny, or one that is extremely large, okay? So again, just like the different motors and generators that are all different, but ultimately at its foundation all the same, same is true for the size, whether it's itty bitty or great big, okay? The same basic principles that we're gonna cover here, the same uh, construction is still true. So let's start right here with the armature and armature windings, okay? So this is the part of the machine which rotates okay the rotating portion of the machine um, has coils of wire which we call windings okay or armature windings um, and all of this together makes up the armature okay constructed of laminated iron core and copper windings okay so the laminated iron core we can we can relate this back to what we've learned so far okay if you have a coil of wire and you put a core inside it that is ferromagnetic, it's focusing those lines of flux, okay? And so this coil of wire, which is the armature winding, is going to create a magnetic field. So if we have a ferromagnetic material uh, within that coil, we're gonna get a more focused, a more dense collection of lines of flux around that armature. It's going to magnify whatever the effect is that's, that's taking place, okay? Now here's something completely different. So we've got a couple of variations at work and we're gonna kind of look at both and do our comparisons as we go along. What we looked at in the previous slide was an actual coil of wire, uh, which rotates in the middle of our motor or generator. Okay, there is another possibility. And this is this thing that we call a rotor. And it's very much like a hamster wheel is really what it looks like. Um, if the rotating portion of the machine does not have any coils of wire, then we call it a rotor. And a rotor is constructed of bars which are shorted out at each end. Okay, so this bar here on the top is connected, it's shorted out to a bar down here on the bottom. Okay, so, so what we have here at the end, this ring which holds it all together, actually creates a number of circuits. This is important because remember, the whole lesson about induction so far, we've talked about induced voltage, 
okay and cutting action results in an, indu in an induced voltage but that induced voltage only results in a current when you have a complete circuit so it's important that this rotor has a whole collection of complete circuits to allow current to flow okay because when current can flow then we get a magnetic field all right and so if a motor is about the interaction of two magnetic fields the pushing and pulling of two magnetic fields okay by shorting out these rotor bars and allowing current to flow through these essentially short circuits means we're going to get tons and tons of current means we're going to get a really nice strong magnetic field so that's where the torque is going to come from that's going to allow this motor to drive itself forward okay if these bars weren't shorted out then the induced voltage would be meaningless because we wouldn't get any current as a result and without current flow we don't get the magnetic field okay so so the construction of the rotor okay these bars are going to rotate through lines of flux get some cutting action okay and 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 because they're shorted out we get current and a magnetic field as a result okay so we've got a comparison here we've got two different things that might be rotating in the middle of our machine okay it could be an armature okay which means it has a coil of wire which we can put current through that coil of wire and create that magnetic field okay the other one is this thing we call a rotor which doesn't have a coil of wire it just has a whole bunch of bars that are shorted out which we can create a magnetic field with okay uh, it, it's kind of a different principle and these ultimately become different machines but with this one variation you know as I was saying so much of the construction is the same which which will be when we look at the next couple of slides okay so just a quick comment here this bullet to give us an idea of, of when we know whether we're talking about a rotor or whether we're talking about an armature okay um, first of all they get flipped back and forth all the time it's it's really remarkable how often what I would say as a rotor is referred to as an armature and vice versa okay but if you go and look for the definition of an armature it is quite generally okay quite broadly any coil that moves okay you guys have used uh, contactors and motor starters in your motor control lab and very often they'll refer to the armature as being the moving part within um, within a contactor okay and if it has a coil that is used somehow to interact with that magnetic field to get the contacts to open and close and that coil actually moves then it is appropriate to, to refer to that as an armature okay so an armature is simply any coil of wire that as part of its normal functioning moves and of course here in the case of the motor or generator it is the rotating part so it's definitely moving so if it's a coil as opposed to just these bars it is definitely an armature okay as opposed to a rotor all right moving on in fact a rotor is used in only a few types of AC motors okay so eventually we're going to stop talking about motors and the lesson is going to focus specifically on generators so we can forget about these things called rotors okay every generator whether it's an AC generator or a DC generator will have an armature okay it's only some types of motors that employ this thing called a rotor okay everything else uh, DC machines AC alternators uh, and some AC motors definitely have armatures and armature windings okay so there's one last thought about the difference okay uh, the conversation moving forward is going to focus on the armature uh, we're kind of just about done talking about the rotor but you'll hear that term a lot so it's important for us to have that conversation okay moving on so that is the part of the machine the part of the generator or the motor that moves let's focus on the part of the machine that does not move okay and in the case of most AC motors we refer to the part of it that remains stationary as the stator okay we tend not to use the term stator when talking about DC machines we're looking at the poles and so on and so forth so let's I think we're going to move the conversation towards that probably won't see the term stator listed anywhere else in the slides we're going to talk about the poles so in this particular image we see four poles 
okay? We're gonna back up when we start really looking at the theory and exactly what's happening inside the generator. We're gonna simplify things even more. We're gonna eliminate these two poles, top and bottom, and we're gonna look at just one set of poles, okay? Uh, you could have two sets, you could have three or four or five. They always come in pairs. So the, the stators and the poles, they provide a ferromagnetic core for the winding. So just like the armature has a ferromagnetic core inside the coil, same thing is gonna be true here in our poles. And that's exactly what our poles are. They are constructed of a highly permeable material such as soft iron. They are also gonna be laminated to reduce eddy currents, just like the core and the transformers, okay? And so these poles are here for another set of windings. So I think that's where the next slide gets leading us into. Here it is. So we have the windings, which are coiled around the poles. Remember, this is the part of the motor or generator that remains stationary, okay? And it creates the magnetic field which influences the rotor or the armature, all right? So we have what we call the main magnetic field, which is gonna be created by these windings which are wound around the pole pieces, okay? It creates our main magnetic field. So we simply attach these windings to a power supply and that's going to create our main field, which is gonna interact with the rotor or the armature as it rotates through these lines of flux. And then finally, we have a commutator or a slip ring, okay? And this image down here shows us some pictures of some slip rings. This image up here is of a commutator, and I'm going to back up and not say too much more about that just yet. We will return to this idea and fill in the blanks, but they are different. In a DC generator, you will have a commutator, and in an AC generator, the alternator, you will have slip rings. Okay, only required in a machine that has an armature. So if it has a rotor, never mind, not required. Because here's what the commutator and the slip rings do. They provide an electrical connection between the fixed external wiring and the rotating armature windings. So this armature rotates. And so we can't just hardwire the two terminal leads onto the two ends of the coil right, because as soon as that starts to spin, it's just gonna coil that up and break it off. All right, so how do we get stationary connections to connect to the, this winding that is rotating? And so the answer, answer is the commutator or the slip rings and the brushes. And we're gonna look at the brushes a little closer on the next slide, okay? Commutator for a DC machine, slip rings for an AC machine, okay? But it's a surface that's on the shaft of the armature and you can see how the windings of the armature are connected to the commutator. Let's move forward and look at the brushes. Now what the brushes do is they actually they're mounted to the chassis or the yoke so they don't rotate but right here they make contact with the rotating commutator. Okay so this is how we get that piece of wire that's external to the motor, comes into the motor, brings the circuit to the motor, but actually connects to the rotating armature. Okay, right here, it simply rides on this surface as the, the commutator, rides on the surface of the commutator as it rotates. So the brushes, they're made up of a soft carbon alloy, okay, conduct electricity, but they're soft. We'll come back to that idea in a moment. They ride on the surface of the commutator or slip rings, depending on whether it's an AC or a DC machine. They are spring loaded to maintain steady contact. So right here at this end, we've got a spring, which is pushing down to ensure we maintain this contact. Okay. And they are a source of maintenance because they wear and there's dust built up as a result of this wear. Okay. So here's the deal. Replacing the commutator would be very difficult. There's friction here. To be, to be sure, there's lots of friction, right? Because we've got a stationary surface rubbing against the, the surface of this rotating uh, armature, sorry, commutator or slip ring. So there's friction. 
okay? Which means parts are gonna wear out, okay? Well, replacing the commutator, which is built right onto the shaft of the armature would be very difficult, okay? So what we wanna do is we want the brush to wear out, okay? Because it's just a small piece in here, okay? Fairly easy for us to replace it, right? Gonna pop the spring off, replace it, put it back on, get the spring back in place, and away we go. So, so it's kind of like the sacrificial lamb in, in this scenario. Okay, we want the brush to wear out because we can replace it fairly easily and we don't want it to wear on the surface of the commutator. Okay, so it is a source of maintenance. It's something we have to do on a, on a regular basis, on a scheduled basis to replace that uh, brush, <clears throat> that piece of soft carbon. Okay. We also need to clean up the mess it leaves behind because as, as it wears, you know, it just leaves dust on everything. Okay, so so that's the main downside, I would say, of any machine that works in this sort of, a, of an application, which is every machine with an armature, which is the advantage of that thing called a rotor because it doesn't need to connect to any external windings. There's no need for these brushes and we don't end up with this maintenance issue, scheduled downtime to do maintenance on the motors or the generators. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Okay, so let's move away from the generic for a moment and let's focus in. We're gonna talk about direct current generators. Okay, here's where we're gonna start the conversation. First thing we have to do is create a constant magnetic field. And we do that by providing DC power to our windings. Okay, it must be DC, it can't be AC power because then we would have constantly changing um, main magnetic field and we want that to be steady. Okay, the main magnetic field has to build and exist and just stay there. Okay, so we start by supplying DC to the field windings. So these windings are gonna create the magnetic field and we're ready to move on. The armature, which contains an armature winding, is rotated through this magnetic field by a prime mover. Okay, so now we return to the conversation about, you know, what kind of power plants do we have? Well, we have coal burning or natural gas burning or nuclear, all of which are creating heat, which creates steam, which turns a turbine. Okay, so that turbine now gets connected to the shaft of our armature and we call that the prime mover, okay? That is the force, uh, that is that is the, um, uh, the energy that's being input into the generator, okay? So that the generator can output electrical energy, okay? So the prime mover gives us that mechanical energy input, all right? Rotates the armature, armature shaft, okay? Now let's look in a little closer and see what we've got going on here. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I've got a couple of other slides here first. I forgot this was the direction we're gonna go. Four factors that determine the output voltage, okay? So the magnitude of the induced voltage is dependent upon, and we have four points here, okay? So how much voltage is generated by the generator? Okay, point number one, the flux density. Remember, if we wanna put units on that, we can talk about Tesla's or Weber's per square meter. Okay, this is how many lines of flux that armature is cutting through as it rotates. Okay, more lines of flux, the greater the induced voltage as a result of the cutting action. Second point, the number of loops of wire cutting through the magnetic field. So we increase the number of turns in the coil and we magnify the effect. We magnify the induction uh, result, okay? the speed at which the coils rotate through the magnetic field. So if we can get that armature rotating faster, okay, we are cutting more lines of flux per second. That's going to increase the, the magnitude of the induced voltage. Okay, so this is the reason why we, we have to fairly carefully manage the, the speed of the prime mover, okay? Um, wind turbines, for example, they don't simply spin at will based on how much wind there is, okay? 
there are there's gearing involved and there's braking involved um, to ensure that the turbine spins at exactly the right speed. Okay, because if it spins too fast, there's too much cutting action and it's producing too much voltage or too little voltage, and, and that value ends up all over the place when it's important that we keep it really constant. Okay. And finally, the fourth point here is the angle at which the armature coil moves across the line of flux. Okay, so so cutting angle becomes a really big part of the conversation. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. We're not quite done with that thought, but let's move on to the next slide. Here's an equation we saw before. EG equals what? So the amount of induced voltage equals what? Well, B is the flux density. L is the length of the conductor, so increase the number of coils, squeeze more conductor into that space that's cutting through the lines of flux, and V is velocity, okay, the speed of the conductor, okay. So in the previous slide we had four items, now our equation only has three. So what is missing from our equation that we just looked at on the previous slide? And the answer is the angle, okay, and it really is here. Okay, we just have to think about this a little bit differently. The cutting angle really speaks to the speed. Okay, and it's not that the conductor changes speed, but it's a matter of the number of lines of flux cut per period of time. Okay, so the next slide, here we go. So let's look at our cutting angle. Okay, so here's what we have. Let's, let's look at it. Here's the pole piece. What's not shown here is that over here we've got the coils of wire that's creating these lines of flux. So that's what all these horizontal lines are. These are the lines of flux. This is the shaft of the generator. So this is the axis around which the armature is rotating. And we're going to look at just a single wire. Okay. So I said earlier that we had uh, an image there with four pole pieces and we're going to just look at two. Okay. We also know that there are many, many coils of wire in the armature but we're gonna bring it right back to just a single wire. So here is our single piece of wire that is part of our armature winding. So let's start up here. If it started here at the 12 o'clock position, in the first 30 degrees of rotation, if we call this zero degrees and we call this 90 degrees, in the first 30 degrees of rotation, how many lines of flux does that conductor cut? Well, based on this particular image, it looks like one, right? Or you could argue none, it didn't cut through that one and it hasn't yet cut through that one, okay? Understand that there's hundreds of millions of lines here, so, so the answer is not none, the answer is some, okay? But not very many. Compared to the second 30 degrees, and now we can see that it's gone through one, two, and we're more than halfway to the third line. So. It's still only 30 degrees of rotation. In terms of the speed that that conductor is traveling, it's traveling at the same speed through the full 360 degrees of rotation. But when we look at it in terms of the cutting angle and the number of lines of flux being cut through as a result of that cutting angle, okay, our cutting action is increasing. Okay, we cut through more lines of flux in the second 30 degrees of rotation than we did through the first 30 degrees of rotation. And then if we look at the third 30 degrees of rotation to get us to our 90 degrees, our first quarter of the way around, we've now cut through even more. So we cut through more lines of flux. There's the other half of that, plus one, two, onto three. So we've, we've cut even more lines here than we did back here, okay? So when our cutting action is perpendicular to the lines of flux, when the direction that that piece of wire is actually moving is perpendicular to the lines of flux, we are cutting through no lines of flux whatsoever. We are producing no induced voltage at that particular point in rotation. And down here, when the conductor is at 90 degrees, so it's now cutting through the lines of flux perpendicular, Okay, this is when we will see maximum induced voltage. Okay, we're cutting through the lines of flux at 90 degrees, and this is going to result in producing the most induced voltage that this generator is ever going to produce at that moment in time. Okay.
That makes sense? Can everybody see that? That's a really big deal moving forward, okay? So let's do exactly that. Let's see what the next slide shows us. So here's our direct current generator. Okay, we have just a single pair of poles. No, this is the North Pole. This is the South Pole with the lines of flux are going to be horizontal here. And here's our single coil of armature winding. Okay, just one coil. Okay, and this that's colored orange is attached to this commutator plate. And this half of the coil down here that's colored purple is attached to this half of the commutator plate. Okay, so the commutator plate is going to rotate with the armature as it rotates, and the brushes are going to remain stationary because they are attached to the chassis of the motor. Okay, so here's where we begin. So you, you see the direction of rotation. So this armature is rotating clockwise through those horizontal lines of flux. So right now, let me get my marker. Right now, this orange conductor is traveling. Oh, I see. Sorry, I have to do this over here. This orange. No. Why isn't that working? Sorry, guys. Bear with me. Pen should be red. I should be able. There it is. So that orange conductor is traveling to the right. This purple conductor on the bottom is traveling to the left. Okay. They are currently traveling exactly perpendicular to the lines of flux. Sorry, parallel. Better get my parallel and perpendicular right. They are traveling in exactly the same direction as the lines of flux, which means there is zero cutting action taking place, which means we find ourselves right here on our diagram. Okay. We have zero volts. Okay. Let's move forward. I think we can zoom in a little bit more. We're actually going to do that right now. So here it is. So, so now we have, we have the gray conductor on the top at the 12 o'clock position, the black conductor here at the bottom at the six o'clock position. And they are right. The two halves of the same wire, right? So the loop going out and then turning and coming back. Okay. So currently, if we're rotating clockwise around the shaft, okay, currently this particular wire is traveling to the left. And this particular wire is traveling to the right. Sorry, right and left. I just got them mixed up too, didn't I? Yikes. I can do better, I promise. The result is zero induced volts. So we're right here. Okay, there is no induced voltage as a result of this um, particular point in the in the rotation because there is no cutting action. Okay, the angle is such that there are no lines of flux being cut. Let's fast forward this 90 degrees. Okay, fast forward this 90 degrees. There we are. So this gray conductor, which was at the 12 o'clock position, has rotated around to the three o'clock position. Okay. What's happened as it travels through this rotation is we see that the voltage starts to increase. Okay. And it peaks at 90 degrees Woo, right there. Okay. Now there's another thing I haven't talked about yet, which I'm just going to throw it here briefly. And that is a rate of change. Okay. So here in the beginning, the rate of change is very significant. Okay. Notice how, notice how this is growing very fast right here. Okay. We have a very steep angle in our growth. Okay. But then as we get near 90 degrees, okay, as our angle changes, we don't really gain a lot in terms of the growth. And so this angle right here is much shallower. Sorry, I can't seem to make a straight line. Wow, that rate, that growth is much shallower than this growth. 
to the point where right at 90 degrees, we have no growth at all, okay? We have a moment where we have a plateau in our induced voltage, all right? It, it hesitates there. So we talked about this a little bit when we were trying to apply Lenz's law to an AC circuit and the, increase, the expanding and collapsing magnetic field and the induced voltage pushing back, okay? There's this moment where everything kind of pauses, okay? And this is it when this conductor cuts through the lines of flux at 90 degrees, okay? There is a moment where we have maximum induced voltage and we pause there just briefly, okay? Let's move on, rotate another 90 degrees. So now this gray conductor that we've been looking at that was here at the three o'clock position has moved on to the six o'clock position. And what's happened is we've had a decay in the amount of induced voltage, okay? Because as the cutting angle gets steeper, as the cutting angle gets steeper and we move around from cutting the lines at 90 degrees, parallel, perpendicular. Why am I struggling with that? Perpendicular to the lines of flux here until we get to the six o'clock position where we're now traveling parallel with the lines of flux, which means we are no longer cutting through any lines and we return to this situation where we have zero induced volts. Okay, so we built through the first 90 degrees of rotation. We, we shrank back to zero through the next 90 degrees of rotation. What we're going to do as we carry on through rotation, we're gonna to continue to focus on this gray conductor, okay? The black conductor completes the circuit and that's important, but to, to really follow this logic, let's just keep focusing on this gray conductor. Because if we were to apply Fleming's generator hand rule, let's do that right here at the three o'clock position when we had our maximum induced voltage, okay? Is the current in that gray conductor coming out towards us or going in away from us? Okay, well, the lines of flux north to south externally mean that we could put arrows in all of these lines of flux pointing from the north pole to the south pole, which means from the left to the right. So that would be our forefinger for flux. And then our thumb is the thrust, is the direction that that conductor is cutting through those lines of flux. So lines of flux, thrust, there is the current. So we would actually put a plus sign on that to say that that current is flowing into the computer screen away from us. All right, and that, that particular direction of current flow has been reported down here as a positive voltage. The polarity of the voltage is pushing the current in that direction, okay, into the screen away from us on that gray conductor. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. We're gonna move that gray conductor up to the nine o'clock position. There it is. So for starters, in terms of magnitude, it's the same story, right? Here, we were not cutting any lines of flux, so we started at zero. And as we cut up through the lines of flux, we get a steeper and steeper angle until we reach this point here where we're cutting our maximum lines of flux and we see a, a, a plateau at its maximum point. But we're now negative, aren't we? And that's because we have changed direction. That conductor is now cutting through the lines of flux in the opposite direction. Okay, for the first 90 degrees of rotation, there are the lines of flux and we were cutting down through the lines of flux. Now we've turned around and we're cutting up through those lines of flux, which means the current is going in the other direction. So this is now a dot here in this gray conductor that we were following around the 360 degrees of rotation, which means the voltage has changed polarity to push the current the other way through that same conductor, right? The current in that same gray conductor that we're following around the rotation, the current's now getting pushed in the other direction. And when we finish our 360 degrees of rotation and get back to where we started, we finish our sine wave, okay? So we end up right back here where we started so that we can come back over here 
and do it all over again. Okay. Now, of course, the way we would actually show that is that we could simply draw the next sine wave. See how I do this with my mouse? That's well, not terribly ugly. But as we go through that 360 degrees of rotation again, we simply repeat ourselves. Okay. So we see AC, alternating current, here in the armature. But wait a minute. Wasn't this the DC generator we were learning about? It sure was. Mind you, up until this point, I will tell you that both the DC generator and the AC alternator are exactly the same. Okay? This is what's happening inside the armature of the generator or alternator. The question now is how we pull that out of the machine. And remember, we've got the two options here, the commutator and the slip ring. So now it's time to find out what the difference is, because this is this is where this change occurs. OK, so let's see. In a DC generator, in a direct current generator, we're going to use a commutator. OK, so we can see here that we've got the two halves. OK, one attached to each wire, which is each end of our loop, our armature winding. OK, and we've got two brushes that are going to ride along on the surface of the commutator as it rotates. This is how we get uh, the induced voltage in the armature uh, connected to an external load, allowing current to flow, getting that induced voltage out of the generator. OK, a commutator and brushes provide a slip connection so that we can get that rotating wire connected to external wires. So we're back to this image. Remember, we looked at this in the very beginning. OK, so we've got a situation here. Here, here's the winding that we were looking at, right? So this top one, which is orange, was the gray one that we were focusing on, recognizing that there must be another half of it, which was the black one, which is shown here as purple, which completes the circuit so that we can get some current to flow. Okay, remembering that this orange one is connected to the commutator plate that's currently sitting on the top, and this purple one connected to the commutator plate shown here at the bottom. Okay. At this particular moment in time, we are traveling parallel to the lines of flux, traveling in the same direction as the lines of flux, not cutting any lines of flux, which means we start at zero volts as the induced voltage as the output of the generator. OK, let's rotate this ahead 90 degrees. So there it is, the output. What we're going to focus on now. OK, so previously we were focusing on what was happening in the armature and we were watching this this orange wire, which in the other set of slides was the gray wire. That was what we we're focusing on. What we want to focus on now is a situation out here at the positive terminal, OK, compared to the negative terminal, of course. But this is our positive terminal. This is a positive output from the generator. OK, as a result of this orange wire cutting down through the lines of flux, OK, being attached to this half of the commutator. Notice how the commutator is rotating right along with the armature winding. OK, so this orange armature winding cutting down through the lines of flux is connected to this half of the commutator, which is connected to this brush, which is connected to the positive output. And we get positive voltage as a result. Let's move forward 90 degrees. So far, so good. Exactly what we would expect. This orange bra this orange wire has continued to cut down through the lines of flux, but the cutting angle is getting sharper to the point where we're no longer actually cutting any lines of flux, and we see a reduction in the induced voltage output back to zero. Again, remember, we're focusing on what's happening right here at this positive output terminal of our generator. What I want to present your attention to now, what I want you to recognize 
is what's happening right here. Okay, this is called commutation. Commutation is when the brush moves from one commutator plate to the next. So the commutator plate is rotating, and so far we've been riding along on this one, which is attached to the orange wire. But we are now shifting over to the other one, and as rotation continues, we're going to completely lose contact with this first commutator plate that we've been riding on all along, and this brush is now going to be in contact with the other commutator plate, which is connected to this purple half of the coil. So remembering that we're focusing on the output of the generator, what's going to happen next? Let's move forward another 90 degrees. Once again, we get an increase in the amount of voltage because the wire is increasing its cutting angle to 90 degrees, but we didn't change polarity this time because we're no longer focusing on this orange wire because this orange wire is no longer connected to the positive terminal, which is what we're focusing our attention on. We're looking at what's happening outside the generator. Okay, you connect a load to this generator. It's not connected to the wires in here in the armature. It's connected to the terminals out here outside of the generator. Well, this positive terminal, which is connected to this brush, which is now riding on this half of the commutator, which is connected to this purple piece of wire in the armature. Okay, this purple piece of wire is now cutting down, I gotta get in the right place, down through those lines of flux. Okay, so what I want you to recognize is that when looking at the output of the generator, when looking at this output right here, it's always connected to the commutator, which is connected to the wire, which is cutting down through the lines of flux. Okay, which means that you will see this growth from zero to max and a decay back to zero, but it's just going to start back up again as commutation takes place and the brush moves from one commutator plate to the next so that it, this brush is always connected to the wire that's always traveling down to the lines of flux. And over here on the negative side, it would be always connected to the wire that's always cutting up through the lines of flux. So we can complete a rotation and we get that. So we say that the commutator provides mechanical rectification. Okay, anybody know what rectification means? Okay, I think in electronics you've probably worked with bridge rectifiers. And a bridge rectifier takes AC and changes it into DC. Okay, and that is exactly what the commutator is doing by mechanical means. There's no electronics involved here. It's simply based on the way it's built. Through mechanical means, we are rectifying the AC, which is found in the armature of the machine, to a DC output from the generator. Okay, now notice the word pulsating. Okay, so this isn't really the kind of DC output that we want, is it? But it's definitely DC, it's direct current because it never changes direction. Okay, it's pulsating, it's not steady DC, but it's unquestionably DC, it is not AC, okay? The, 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 the polarity of the voltage never changes. We never see it pushing current in the other direction, okay? When looking at the output of the generator. Now, if it is AC that you want, if it's an AC alternator rather than a DC generator, all we have to do is find a way to get that AC that's in the armature out of the machine without rectifying it, okay? So the uh, AC generator, which is referred to as an alternator, is built exactly the same as the DC generator with one small but vital adjustment. And that vital adjustment is to eliminate the, the commutator with the commutator plates with a couple of slip rings. So this first slip ring is connected to um, one end of the loop 
and the other slip ring is connected to the other end of the loop and they never trade places. So that the alternating um, voltage and current that we see inside the armature can be brought right out of the alternator without any computation, without any commutation, without any rectification. Okay. And so now this needle is going to continue to deflect back and forth as the armature rotates through the lines of flux. Okay, so that's that's the only adjustment we need. We replace our commutator plates with slip rings. Okay, and then there's this thing called three phase AC, which we haven't talked about yet. Uh, but let me just finish the conversation about alternators and we'll revisit this next week. So the three phase alternator, once again, is the same basic instruction. We just make one more adjustment. And that is that now we need three separate loops. OK, three separate loops to cut through those lines of flux at different angles. And the loops are mechanically 120 degrees out, out of phase, 120 degrees spread apart. OK, so the three of them get you around the full 360. All right. So here's the first red loop. OK, and 120 degrees later, it's actually not this purple. That one's only 60 degrees away. Here's what we would call um, B1. So if we called this red one here A1, 120 degrees later would be B1. And 120 degrees later is the purple one down there is C1, which makes this purple up here C2. The other red was A2. Like I say, we'll get into this more next week. The point is that we've got... To get three phase power, we need three separate sets of windings, each with its own set of slip rings. OK, so it looks like there's only one slip ring for red. These are actually all pairs. We need one on either side, right? A1 and A2, B1 and B2 and C1 and C2. OK, so that's enough about three phase for now. The construction is really the very same. What three phase is, we'll talk about more next week, I promise. So when I first taught um, the notion of cutting action, when we talked about uh, what is induction, first we talked about a moving conductor and a stationary field, and then we flipped it around and said, but what if it's a stationary conductor and a moving field? Well, the answer was it works the very same. Okay, And the fact of the matter is that the same could be true here. Okay, So this on the left is the revolving armature. This is exactly what we've been looking at. Right, so here's our DC power supply creating our main field, which is steady. This is always the north over here on the left, always a south over here on the right. Arrow is always pointing from left to right, and we rotate the armature through that magnetic field. Okay, well, we could actually do it the other way around. Okay, we could attach our DC power supply to our slip rings, feeding power feeding current into the armature we still need the prime mover to move that armature okay but now what we're doing is we're moving the magnetic field through the winding see notice even here this says armature and it's pointing to the windings on the pole pieces so i would argue that that's not true that doesn't fit the definition of any winding that moves okay the reason they've chosen to do this is because of the the notion that it's the armature that 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 generates the the output voltage okay and and so i think that's why they've chosen to label this as the armature i would argue that that's an inappropriate label but the notion is that we have the moving magnetic field as a result of the um, rotation of this armature getting that magnetic field the lines of flux to cut across these stationary wires and we get an output voltage as a result okay so we can we can hold the magnetic field stationary and move the winding or we can hold the winding stationary and move the magnetic field um, either of these constructions would would accomplish the same task and so this is where we start to see that, that there are all kinds of different variations in terms of the constructions of these machines, but they all have to follow the same principles.